Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're pleased to welcome Dylan Farrow in celebration of the publication of Hush, her debut novel. And she'll be joined in conversation by author Emily A. Duncan and our moderator, um, senior editor at St. Martin's and Wednesday Books, Vicki Lame. A reminder about our Zoom etiquette, you heard me as you were Zooming in, but you're muted and you will remain muted. We do ask that you keep your video off for the duration of the event as well. The chat window is closed um, to public chatting, but you might wanna keep the chat box open because I will drop links to purchase books from Literati Bookstore in the chat. And you can submit your questions at any time to the host of the event, Vicki. Um, only Vicki will see your questions and she can ask a uh, selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation. So whenever you feel uh, moved to ask a question, feel free to submit it. Um, again, you'll only be able to send those questions to Vicki. Um, you might also wish to keep your speaker view on and, and as opposed to the grid view. That way you'll just see who's speaking on your screen. It's usually the ideal uh, viewing experience. So you'll see who's speaking and not just a big grid of names. Um, and then one more time for those of us who are just joining us, um, you're muted, you'll remain muted and we do ask you keep your video off through the duration of the event. As a reminder, you can purchase Hush on our website and I'll include a link in the chat. And also if you're watching later on YouTube, there will be links to purchase books from Literati Bookstore in the description below. You can shop for all sorts of books at literatibookstore.com and thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in the Southeast Michigan area. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming, whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or maybe this year's subscription to our virtual programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this afternoon or this morning or maybe this evening, depending on uh, wherever in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce our authors. Dylan Farrow is a writer, mother, and activist for survivors of sexual assault. Growing up in both New York and rural Connecticut, she spent countless hours drawing and writing for pleasure. After graduating from Bard College, she found a position at CNN as a production assistant and later moved into graphic design. Soon, however, she felt neither were her calling. Dylan returned to writing full-time, exploring her love of YA fantasy, and Hush is her debut novel. And Emily A. Duncan is the New York Times bestselling author of Wicked Saints. She works as a youth services librarian and received a master's degree in library science from Kent State University, which mostly taught her how to find obscure Slavic texts through inter the interlibrary loan system. When not reading or writing, she enjoys playing copious amounts of video games and Dungeons and Dragons, and she lives in Ohio. Please join us in using your uh, Zoom clap or heart reactions to welcome Emily and Dylan and Vicky into your living rooms. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. You know, I think it's the rare treat that an editor actually gets to do an event with an author of hers, much less two authors of hers. And, you know, it is both very exciting and also very nerve wracking because as an editor, I'm very used to being behind the scenes. Um, but I'm so glad to be here with both Dylan and Emily. And Dylan, you know, happy pub day. You know, I don't, I don't even you. think you've said it out loud yet. Happy pub day. Um, yeah. Thank yeah. you. So Dylan, how are you feeling? I mean, your book's finally in the world. I can't believe it. <laughs> it <laughs> is, like, it's, I mean, it's, it's thrilling. It's, it's so exciting. And at the same time, like I haven't left my house in like six months. So it's a little bit surreal, <laughs> but, um, I just, I couldn't be more excited. Um, like I, I, I've been like, you know, sitting in this like chair for about two years since Hush started, since I put, you know, started, started typing the first chapter and like it, it I, I, I could not um, conceive of two years later <laughs> um, being in this chair <laughs> and and premiering it to the world it's it's amazing and i i, I couldn't be more excited uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this hmm? sorry why, sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry um why don't you tell us a little bit about hush well uh hush is 
A story about uh, a young girl who is off on a journey of self-discovery after a tragedy strikes. And it follows her journey in learning how to speak up for what she believes in and finding out who she is and what she is capable of. Amazing. Um, you know, one of this is one of my favorite things about your book is, in fact, that journey and sort of how I think it's an important journey for people to read. Um, you know, I'm wondering if for you it's sort of the same, like in terms of like you know the coverage that has gotten and just readers reading it. If that's really something that you're valuing, I mean, it's it's always been like a great dream of mine to be able to connect to people through writing and. Um, it's it's just amazing to me that 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 it's happening. It's here. <laughs> the days the days arrived. Um, so yes, this is incredibly meaningful to me um, on so many levels. What has um, what's what's been your sort of favorite part of the debut process? Um. Well, I mean, my my mom baked me a cake the other night. That was really oh. beautiful. <laughs> Um, cake is a good part of it. <laughs> you know, if I get cake, I'm, I'm usually a happy camper. I've, I've, I've also, I mean, it's been <laughs> incredible to me to see um, all of the uh, positive uh, reactions I've been getting in the press. Um, it's very much not what I'm used to <laughs> in terms of press, um, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and, um, I mean, just all of it is, is, is just so cool. I mean, it's an added bonus that I don't even have to leave my home office. Oh, well, heck yeah. <laughs> um, Emily, do you have any, as sort of our seasoned veteran with, you know, you're working, your second book, Ruthless Gods, just came out. Your third one is coming out in April, 2021, Blessed Monsters. Um, do you have any sort of like advice for Dylan? Uh, <laughs> my favorite part of being a debut was when I was no longer a debut. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. My, uh, it was very stressful. Um, and my advice was to take a lot of walks. I took a lot of walks in 2019. <laughs> because for me, especially, I... I got very overwhelmed very fast by the feedback and like by processing all of the reactions um, because it was a lot all at once from every direction. And so I had to find ways to like filter out all of that. And now like there, there are times when I get tagged in like seven things in, on Instagram at once and I hate it because that's too many, that's too much. Too many people are looking at me at one time. Um, but <laughs> it's gotten, it gets better with like, you get desensitized to it, which feels like a weird thing to say, but a lot of the, the more overwhelming aspects of it for me um, got better when I got used to them. That sounds amazing, honestly. I can't wait to be, be desensitized. <laughs> You'll, you'll get there, and then you're just like, oh, yeah, I wrote a book. <laughs> okay. yeah, that's, that, oh, that, that's <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, not, not to state the obvious, but writing a book is very hard. It takes so much creative energy and concentration. And I think, you know, right now, particularly, we're in the middle of a pandemic and so many other things, like, we're, that's something we're all struggling with. And I'm sort of wondering, for both of you, like, what your writing routine was, you know, I'm assuming it was just turned entirely upside down and how you sort of dealt with that and what the new routine you found is. Um, well, for me personally, I mean, because I finished writing Hush before the pandemic. Um, it has impacted writing the sequel, I think, <laughs> obviously. Um, Ooh. Book two and a pandemic. Oh my god! That yeah, that's be been so my hard. experience so far. Oh, has been no. book two has been the pandemic book. 
Um, not just your experience. I feel like a huge part experience. of that has been like coming up with a system. Um, just because I'm also here raising a, a four year old who is home full time now, <laughs> um, with a with a partner who also works full time. So coming up with you know a schedule that we can keep keep to I mean usually what will happen is I'll get the kiddo in the morning and then I get tagged in to work in the afternoon <laughs> and then I tag back in for for dinner <laughs> um and I'm also very lucky that I have a free babysitter like right down the street to my mom <laughs> yeah so what, what in case you're wondering where my kid is now <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> what about you Emily um, oh God. <laughs> so I, it was bad. It was really bad. I, cause I work full time. Um, cause I'm a youth services librarian and I had a very structured way of doing things. Um, that is gone now, but I also like, I, the way I functioned was the second that I am home, I am not, th I'm not thinking about the library. Like I, I will not look at my library email. Like if you desperately need me and why would you, if I'm not there, you can text me and that's the only way you can contact me. And so having to pivot, cause now we work, um, we work a day in the library and then a day at home. So now I have to think about the library at home and it's been awful. <laughs> Horrible. So I've had to navigate around that and having to, like the my work from home days tend to take the the entire day because I'm terrible at focusing. So then I am like, well, when am I supposed to write? Because ordinarily it would be after work, but work just keeps going. And then I, because my writing process is a nightmare, right now is when I would be um, not working at home at all, but working like writing in a coffee shop. Because when I get to a point in drafting where I just have to write the book, um, I can't work in my apartment and there are no coffee shops to work in. So everything is bad. It's just bad all around. I miss coffee shops. But it's fine. I am, I miss coffee shops. I miss coffee shops that you just like hit me right in the heart with that. <laughs> I had one that I found and I wrote like all of Blessed Monsters in it. And like, I drive past the exit for it every time I go to work and I'm just like, oh, I miss you so oh much. I just found out yesterday that my local coffee shop closed. Oh. Because of the oh, pandemic. No. Like, just, oh, uh, so I'm sad. I'm scared to check. Like, I don't, I don't want to look up the, where like what the status of this coffee shop is because I don't want to know if they're closed. I just yeah, need to keep right? on living with the yes. hope that when just, this just is over, live our lives I can go coffee. back. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, no, I, I, I don't blame you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I kept hoping for the best on all of my favorite places and knowing it's not going to work out. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, Dylan, you, I'm holding up the books. I realize none of us have done it. Um, how shiny it is. Um, so Dylan, you have written a fantasy where magic is sort of used to, you know, manipulate and silence, you know, individuals and stop them from speaking out against those in power, essentially. And Emily, you know, in Ruth with Gods, you know, you've written this world where magic is sort of deeply tied to religion or lack thereof in some cases. You know, and I'd love for each of you to speak about, you know, sort of what inspired your books and what you wanted to, like, really get through. Um, Dylan, if you want to start. Um, well, I guess starting out with the world of Montaigne and, gosh, the, when, when dinosaurs rolled, roamed the earth in 2018. <laughs> um, <laughs> um it was sort of at the beginning of seeing a lot of social and cultural changes. And I guess I what, what, what sort of set me on the path to creating this uh, particular fictional world was, you know, sort of thinking about how that could apply in, 
in a magical sense, how, how, how would uh, a fictional universe kind of hold up a mirror to that? Um, and I guess that was sort of like the little spark that wound up, uh, wound up creating, creating that world. Um, but yeah, cause it, it, a lot of it was sort of just taking in, uh, this sort of, yeah, the, this climate of everything is saturated by information and words and, uh, news and seeing just sort of how I could play with that theme a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I have to say, like when it when the book came into us, you know, we were I, when I read, first read it, you know, I just found it so chilling because it did seem so relevant in just so many ways because there is so much news out there, and so much of it is incorrect, and some you know, there's people out there who are feeding us incorrect news, and it just I don't know, it just felt so like it sort of really hit me, and I was like, oh gosh, and it just felt so relevant, and I feel like it only grows more relevant somehow. <laughs> Yeah, that I did not did not foresee that. <laughs> some some parts of that, like especially especially with the plague, I was oh yeah, yeah. I was not uh, I was not really prepared for for that level of of relevancy. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think what what I my my goal was to sort of create a world that was fictional, but also could be relatable that you know mm -hmm. readers could um see a little bit of their world in yeah and what about you emily i don't um, think you have any blood mages running around anytime soon but <laughs> luckily it's funny because um i have the i have a, I have the serious answer and then i have the real answer um because the real answer of what inspired the series was i was in college not writing a paper and playing skyrim and I, it was it was like a mountain and it was just super pretty and I was like oh that's nice and then I was in grad school and I was playing Dragon Age Inquisition and the mages like the one mage costume they have spell books at their hips and I was like oh that's cool and that was it that was my inspiration um we just went from there <laughs> but no I um I had wanted it all kind of like I don't know what I'm doing when I'm writing until long after the fact. So it's hard to say, well, I set out to do this because I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I don't know what I'm doing ever. And so I wanted to write a book about um, a girl with a direct line. And I wanted it to, I wanted to treat it kind of like a pantheon that you would see in like something that was Greek. I say Greek just because I'm reading, rereading the Queen's Thief books and it's Greek and so the gods are all there and there's a lot of them. Um, and I didn't really set out to, um, to make it the story that it became of the gods being kind of sketch. Uh, it just kind of grew out from when I was, when I was building, I knew I wanted a holy war because I liked the, I liked that kind of conflict. And I knew that if you were going to work with divine magic, what would the opposite be? Well, if you don't need the gods for blood magic, then we'll use blood magic. And then it all became, it all just kind of exploded from there. And it just, it, it, it fell far out of my control. Um, basically, Malachiash got involved and then I was no longer in charge. Um, but I, wa <laughs> I wanted to write about just the way religion or the lack thereof kind of weaves through individuals' worlds and how that affects the greater world outside of it. Okay. That seems like That's a, a good great answer. serious answer. I got there. I got there at the end. <laughs> Your not serious answer was also great. <laughs> Well, you probably saw me like flipping Still out when one. you mentioned Skyrim and Dragon Age and like, yeah, no. Like. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually one of my questions. If y'all want to like skip right to it, you know, what, you know, I know. How you much know, time do we have? have. <laughs> <laughs> like, gaming, how has gaming like influenced your work? And like, what are some of the games you nerd out on? Oh, are, are, are we really skipping to the video games? Because like, this will get me really excited. <laughs> do it. We can do what we want. <laughs> right. We do what we want. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, Emily just 
brought up two two of my serious favorites. Um, so I guess um, I guess one of the games that like I just I I, I fell in love with the the storytelling. Um, this was like kind of like a, a complete surprise to me because I did not expect to like fall in love with this game, but. Actually, this was my brother Ronan's fault. He like he came up to me like back when I was like in college, and he was like, "Have you played Knights of the Old Republic?" And I was like, "That uh... that's a Star Wars game. That sounds that sounds lame." <laughs> <laughs> and he was one. like, "No, no, 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 no. Like you're 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 misunderstanding this game. Like you need to sit down and, and you need to play this game." So. I sat down in his room, his computer, and I was like, you know, I started playing, you know, what I thought was going to be like this hokey, like Star Wars game. And about five hours later, <laughs> I was still like, I was still there. And I was like, no, I, I, I need to figure out, you know, like how I'm going to get Bastila off Terrace. Like, this is, this is a big deal now. <laughs> and he was like, have you gotten to the plot twist? And I was like, there's a plot twist. And I just like didn't, I kind of like wrote it off, didn't really hear it. And then several hours later, like he hears me shrieking. I think I woke him up. <laughs> and he was like, I know what part of the game you're at. And that <laughs> plot twist, I swear to God, like the, it is now my litmus test for, for plot twists, like to this day, because it was just, it blew my mind. It was, I mean, that game is just such such masterful writing and such such incredibly like compelling characters and stories and it's woven into the star wars mythos loosely enough that you you, you get some of the nostalgia but um I, I i mean i probably should be like plugging my book but like this game just like changed my life yeah, but it's important. I think, you know, like, all sorts of media feeds into what y'all are creating in a way. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that video games are, 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 are kind of overlooked in terms, in terms of like how good the writing can be and how it impacts the experience you have. Like, I mean, if, if I get sucked into a, a well-written game, like it, it has the same effect on me as right as reading a, a a classic novel. It's it's that good. Kitty. Oh, Emily, talk so we can see the kitty. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's knocking a bottle cap off the desk. Oh, there it goes. Now what are you gonna do? Okay, Aww. bye. Um. <laughs> now the bottle cap is gone. What a surprise. Aww. So. Oh man. I've, I've mentioned Skyrim, which I have played so many hours of that I is, oh, it's obscene. It's an obscene number of hours played. I've, I've played so many hours of Skyrim and I've never played either of the two main quests. So that's how I play games. And also I get made fun of in my friend group a lot because I play video games like for a few hours at a time and then move to other video games. So I don't finish anything. I finished two video games in my whole life. <laughs> Wow. I finished Dragon Age 2 because it's super short. It is. I got one battle away from the end of Dragon Age Inquisition, and I got stressed out, and I never finished it. So that's... I got two battles away from the end of Fire Emblem, and I got stressed have out. You, have you played the, the, the Trespasser DLC, though? Like, you've gotten to the end of that? No. <laughs> But it's so good. The Trespasser DLC. <laughs> the Trespasser DLC came out right when I was revising Wicked Saints. It was just enough time to be like, oh, I did the same thing. Oops. <laughs> I've only gotten through it once. Like, and I meant to go through with like all of my 800 characters because I'm kind of like the opposite. Uh -huh. I guess in playing games is like, I will like find a game I like and I will like latch onto it for months, <laughs> if not years. And uh -huh. I will just uh -huh. play the just bejesus so out of it, like over and over and over <laughs> and over obsessively until I have completed everything that I could possibly get my hands on. 
And only then do I like grudgingly release it and move on to my next, <laughs> my next game, my next victim. I'm, I'm currently my downloading like, uh, Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> I am also currently downloading that, and I think that's why my internet is bad. I just oh, that. well, that's a good reason, though. I'm really excited to play that. <laughs> like, as we're starting, Emily's looking at all of us as and it has been for a while. <laughs> As we were starting, I was like, oh, I didn't close my laptop and it's downloading an 82 gig game. That would be why I can't see anyone's videos. Yeah, no, like, I'm, like, tempted to, like, check my download now because I'm, like, curious how far it's coming. But, yeah, like, I, I, was, I was up last night and I was like, what time does it release, you know, in my time zone so that, like, I can go on Steam, like, immediately. <laughs> Get the download. I'm so excited. I'm so, I'm so excited. <laughs> well, I'm going to get it back to books now. Because um, oh, okay. I was mentioning like, how you have such amazing, compelling characters. And one of the things I love so much about both of your books is the just really complicated characters in the books. You know, they're going through a lot. They're flawed. They're making a lot of mistakes, which I think is very human. And it's what people do until they arrive at like, the point where they're like, oh, that was a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I should try doing this other thing. It's a mistake instead <laughs> then eventually they get at the right answer um and so i wanted to ask each of you like what is there a particular favorite character that you have in each of your books it's a hard question i know <laughs> it's not a hard question for me <laughs> <laughs> oh i know it's not <laughs> looks like it's harder for dylan though i was thinking <laughs> because Actually, like what what first pop the first thing that popped into my head was like, is there a character that I like more than Canon? And the answer is no. <laughs> There's <laughs> Canon is is my is my absolute favorite of, of of all the of all the characters in the book. I mean, writing from writing Canon from from Shay's point of view was almost like you know more interesting because. Um, she's she's not getting the full picture, and so much of their relationship is 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 Shay trying to figure out like who is this who is this girl, <laughs> what is she all about, and why is she such a <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think what I I I, I almost approached. I approached her almost as she's the character who um, who holds up the mirror to to Shay and and calls her out on all of her BS, um, which was fun kind of as a writer because then Shay gets all flustered and <laughs> upset. Um, but I like to think that Kenan is the character who says what we're all thinking. <laughs> and um and also she she kicks butt so she's she's definitely a she, she's definitely a favorite for me <laughs> what about you Emily? i think we know if anyone's read your books <laughs> again I just, I just i just love malachia so much he's just the worst He's the worst ever, and he never gets any better, and I just really love him a lot. But, like, I tried to write Wicked Saints so many times from when I got the idea in college, and I would always get to, like, the 15,000 word mark and just get completely stuck. Like, could not make any forward motion. I tried literally everything I could think of. Um, I had Seraphin meet Nadia at like the begin, not like the beginning, beginning, but like at that 15K mark and it didn't work. I kept like moving point of views around and like nothing worked. And then I was like, you know what? We're gonna throw spaghetti at the wall and I'm gonna throw in like 12 characters. And surely, surely someone will have something for me to work with. Um, and most of those characters were cut because they were useless, um, <laughs> except for stupid Malachiash, who then took the entire book and said, well, this is, this is mine now. Um, 
I was surprised by the end of as surprised by the end of Wicked Saints as everybody else because then I had to go back and be like, well, I didn't know this was going to happen, so now nothing I've written up till this point makes any sense. Um, <laughs> but it's just he. <laughs> he's fun to write, but it's also a nightmare all the time. <laughs> Writing in his point of view was a lot of it was a lot of words because he does so much thinking so much <laughs> Dylan do you find your characters sometimes surprise you too oh, they just absolutely. sort of like do what they want <laughs> yeah yeah I'm I, um Shay was was one of those characters in particular where I would have sort of like a set idea of where I wanted her to go and she would just kind of like stroll off in, in a different direction and be like no I think I'm just gonna go over here and you know poke this hornet's nest for a change um <laughs> which is I mean part of why I why I love her but also what you know definitely infuriates me um Ravode was another such character who kind of took took on a mind of his own um initially in like the earliest drafts, like before you, before you even saw anything, <laughs> um, Ravode was a playboy <laughs> in like a certain iteration. Oh, very handsome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then somehow, you know, like he, he, he was just like, no, that's, that's not who I am. Um, I'm actually like completely emotionally unavailable and I'm kind of a jerk. <laughs> And I'm very aloof and, and mysterious, and I don't like talking to people, no. especially girls. <laughs> um, I can... <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Emily. No, I can always trust Seraphim to not want to do anything. The one character that never surprises me. It's true. He just wants never to wants to do a single thing. <laughs> It's good to have. It's good to have some stability. There, there are those characters that you can rely on, and you know those are those are rare. You gotta gems, have I at least like. one. Yeah, yeah, at least <laughs> one per story. You know, they pop up and yeah. don't surprise you, and you're just like, thank you for not making my life extra hard. And then you glare at your other characters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Um, so I wanted to ask, because, you know, I know, like, you know, Emily, I know you've been waiting on the Megan Whalen Turner and all of that. So I wanted to ask, like, what books, you know, <clears throat> during this time have you helped you sort of, like, escape real life? Or, like, what are some consistent favorite rereads for you, even, that you can find comfort in? It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you, are, you, are, are you asking me or Emily? I'm asking both of you. Oh, I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, because if I'm being completely honest, I haven't been able to read a book in about four years. The, <laughs> the last time I finished a book was um, right before my daughter was born. Uh, I, bet you get, I get that you get it in a lot of picture books, though. You know, like... If we're talking about, like, you know, little kids' books, like, that I've been able to read over and over and over because, Mommy, I want to read this book. Um, I mean, I could probably recite to you Llama Llama Red Pajama at this point, and I could oh, probably... Good. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. And I was actually really... That's a good one. <laughs> I was actually really happy that my daughter latched onto Madeline because that was a favorite of mine when... House in Paris covered in vines, like that was like such such a staple of my childhood. Um, and uh, so she she loves she loves Madeline, and she's actually like this is kind of weird, but she's like developing an interest in Greek mythology. So I have started reading her. Mm -hmm like some Greek mythology and she's like learning like about 
the Greek pantheon and she knows like about Hercules and uh, Zeus. I mean, you know, all in PG terms and stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean like, trying to disseminate that for a four-year-old can be a little tricky at times um but it's actually been like an interesting time like going back to like some of my very first uh favorite books and enjoying them with her um and uh I have a feeling that, you know, she's, she's going to be reading on her own very soon. So I'm just sort of trying to like absorb this time when she needs me to read her, read to her as much as possible, because it's, it's so much fun. <laughs> oh, I love that. What about you, Emily? I've, uh, uh, I've read Gideon the Ninth uh, three times this year. So Dylan uh, that's one I've, all, I've <laughs> just just love it so much um and then I have been rereading and I you know I've I've it was really hard to read at the beginning of the pandemic but I I've been reading a lot just because I I love blurbing books and I don't know how to say no and so everybody asks and I always say yes and then I read everything and then um I've well, read a lot this sure. year. You said that. I know. I said it out loud. It's fine. It's, it's it's like every day at this point, and it's it's out of control. Um, but I love doing it. So, but I have found that I can foc. I can't focus on anything new. I can focus when I'm rereading, because I have been rereading um, the Queen's Thief series by Megan Whalen Turner, which started, I first read it when I was a teenager, um, because it started in the 90s, and the last one came out today, which is fine. I don't have it yet, <laughs> because my bookstore never called, so I'm fine, um, <laughs> but it's been nice to, <laughs> I want it so bad. I can't read it yet, I'm only book three into, into my reread, and it's book six, but still, I want to hold it. Um, it's been nice to read things that, like, I know that I love, and there's less pressure. There's pressure when you're reading new things. There's so much pressure. And it's been nice to read something with z no pressure at all. Nobody cares that I'm rereading this old series, and that's very nice. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, so I'm going to open it up to some questions from the chat. And Diva, hi Diva, has asked, who is your favorite, or actually, let's go, with which character is most like you? Dylan, do you want to start? Which character is most like me? I mean, it's hard because, like, they're all a little bit like me because I wrote them. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> Taking different aspects of yourself. Yeah, so it's interesting because, like, you know, if I had to sort of, like, assign a different characteristic of myself to, like, you know, each of them, that would probably be a little bit simpler, maybe more honest. Um, most like me, I mean... I guess, strictly speaking, it wound up being Shay. Um, you know, I, I, I try to extract myself bit by bit as I write her, mm -hmm. um, because she takes on her own personality, like I said, and she starts doing things that I would never in a million years consider. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she's... Um, I guess at the beginning of the book, she's a lot more like me. Um, and then towards the end, she kind of takes on her own, her own personality. Um, I guess the character that I wound up like kind of surprisingly feeling the most connected to was Shay's mom. <laughs> um, and maybe that's weird because she she's she's not like a major character or anything, but um, when I started writing her, um, 
you know, I was a new mom and there was just a lot that I felt I was, I was sort of connecting to this new layer of myself and my life um, as a, as a mom. And so I, I felt a certain, a certain deep connection and conveying that, that love and that connection through, through Shay's mom. So that, that might be kind of like the weird answer, but maybe the most honest. <laughs> I love that though. And I feel like, you know, with Shay's mom, it's like, you know, we don't, we don't learn a ton about her in book one, but I get the feeling we're going to learn a little more about her in book two. We'll see. My lips are sealed. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Emily? Oh, it's, it's Seraphin. I also don't like doing anything and would just rather have a drink and take a nap. 100%. <laughs> well, DJ in the chat says Seraphin in all caps. Yeah. I also can't see anything. So that also, yeah, that also helps. <laughs> <laughs> He's always been the easiest to write. Nadia has always been the hardest. Um, but Seraphin has always been super easy mostly because because my books tend to be extremely internal um his thought process is very similar to mine in a way that Nadia's is not um and so I don't like think we're like super alike but he's the one that I'm like well if it's got to be one of the three of them it's the one that doesn't want to do anything <laughs> <laughs> love it um, <laughs> Seraph and Shay are both great characters so I, I'm glad y'all put parts of yourselves in them. Um, so from the chat, we have Emily asking, you know, how do y'all re sort of renew your creativity when writer's block hits? Gosh. I wish I had like a really, really good answer for this. <laughs> I think usually it's just like some, it, it, sometimes I just have to like, you know, break through the wall by writing more or by like sitting in front of a blank page and, and hating it for a little bit. Um, but I, I, I do sort of take a, a measure of comfort from the fact that I have gotten over 100% of my writer's blocks that I've experienced. <laughs> so on some level, I feel like I know they're temporary and that, kind of helps <laughs> yeah so I think I, I agree I feel like sometimes for a lot of people it is really just sort of pushing through yeah I don't know and I actually you get there <laughs> what about yeah. you generally I have found that if I am stuck on something I don't I don't know if I would even call I don't know I don't know if I would call it writer's block if I get stuck it means I've made a wrong decision at some point which is why I start over my drafts 14,000 times. Um, and 100% of the time that is absolutely correct. It can be something completely minor, but the, like the thing that I'm writing now, I realized that I needed to frame it slightly differently. Um, could have kept writing with the assumption that I had just already made that change. And I did try to do that, but I got to a point where I was like, I can't, I need to make these adjustments and fix how I've set everything else up or I'm just going to keep hitting the same wall that I'm hitting right now um ended up changing like one sentence and it was very annoying because it was <laughs> a very minor thing that was wrong um but like 100% of the time it just means that at some point I have thought I will go in this direction and then I will get further on and be like oh no that was the wrong way I need to go back in and not go that direction and go the other direction um and I also, in a more like concrete, I find that if I am, like if I've sat at my desktop computer all day and have written 12 words, if I go and do writes in another way, like if I write on my laptop instead, or if I write longhand, or if I break out my alpha smart that everyone is obsessed with now even though we were all obsessed with them eight years ago it comes back in popularity every few years 
um, then that also helps. Sometimes it's just that I've been looking at the same environment for too long and I need to be looking at something different. Not this corner. It's been this corner for so many months. I'm so tired of this corner. <laughs> corner one day <laughs> one day <laughs> one day um so i think you know it's almost time to wrap up so i'm going to take one last question from the chat and this is from chapati and she was asking um um Chastity would like to see hear what y'all think young adult fantasy offers as a genre that is special and unique and what drew you to it as a genre as writers Hmm. I think young adult fantasy, I mean, I think when I decided to tackle it, it was mostly because I wanted to write something that I thought I might have enjoyed back when I was that age. Um, something that I might not have seen a whole lot of. Um, and... I mean, there's, there's, there, it, it's a very sort of saturated um, market. There's so many like amazing things out there. Um, so I, I think that there was also that uh, sort of, it, it was, it was almost, I don't know, like a challenge <laughs> to think like, you know, what can I contribute to this? Um, and I think, I think at least where where Hush is concerned, I, I, what I wanted to do was like try and uh, take what I'd seen and what I've what I had read when I was a young adult and sort of write the the book that I wanted to read back then. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. What about you, Emily? Break out my soapbox. I have five different answers for this question um <laughs> one is similar to dylan's i wanted to write like for 15 year old emily and anyone like 15 year old emily who just wanted the the evil wizard raceland and dragon lance to also be the love interest <laughs> so that there's that just just because of that um my other answer is that young adult fantasy in particular is a way to focus in on transformational moments in a character's life because a lot of you do a lot of growing up in those kind in those types of years so when I was writing when I started writing with Good Saints even though I prefer to come at things from sometimes a more typical adult fantasy viewpoint because that's mostly what I what I grew up on and what I read um, it made more sense for it to be YA because it is happening at a point in Nadia's life where everything is crumbling and she's got to grow up real fast. Um, and then my third answer is that it's all fake. It's all just, it's all just fantasy about different ages of characters. And I will get off my soapbox. I actually have a very like I have a lot of thoughts about like genre categories and like age ranges and where books fit in them and why we call books written by women that are adult YA and the, it's a lot but for me I wanted to write for 15 year olds who also liked the evil wizards and thought that they should get kissed they deserve kisses yeah more kids maybe they deserve you. them but they should <laughs> I don't know. I feel like 15 year old Dylan would have been on board with that. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, this has been amazing. Um, for everybody who has been tuning in, there are links to Dylan's Hush, which is out today, and then Emily's Ruthless Gods. These are very heavy books, guys. Um, link to these in the chat where you can buy them and you know this has been amazing and thank you all for tuning in and you know if y'all need further thoughts on video games just hit emily and dylan up on twitter <laughs> uh, that's we a have a lot of I'm video always... game thoughts <laughs> i do I, yeah i know like i want to talk about video games more with you emily <laughs> <laughs> those are very similar tastes too and like that's not that, yeah. that's like a very rare gift i feel like yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. Close an event. <laughs> thank you both for, for joining us on behalf of the bookstore. Thank you, Vicki, for, for, for hosting tonight or this afternoon. Sorry, my brain's on the wrong way. Um, and yeah, I dropped another link in the chat to buy books and we hope to see you at some of our events coming up. And, and thanks, Emily and Dylan again. And Dylan, congrats on Pub Day and continued success uh, on the series. We're looking forward to the next one too. Can't wait for it already, even though the first one just came out. <laughs> I'm working on it.